And now, my conversation with Dr. Carl Dyseroff. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time coming for me uh, because uh, you may not know this, but one of the reasons I started this podcast was actually so I could have this conversation. <laughs> it's, it's but one. There are other sure. reasons. But one of the goals is to be able to hold conversations with colleagues of mine that are doing incredible work in the realm of science. And then here we also have this really special opportunity because you're also a clinician. You yes. see patients and yep. have for a long time. Yep. So for people that might not be so familiar with the fields of neuroscience, et cetera, what is the difference between neurology and psychiatry? Well, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm married to a neurologist and I am a psychiatrist and we make fun of each other all the time. So uh, this is... My guest is Dr. Carl Dyseroff. Dr. Carl Dyseroff is a medical doctor. He's a psychiatrist and a research scientist at Stanford School of Medicine. In his clinical practice, he sees patients dealing with a range of nervous system disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder, autism, attention deficit disorders, schizophrenia, mania, anxiety disorders, and eating disorders. His laboratory develops and explores tools with which to understand how the nervous system works in the healthy situation, as well as in disorders of the mind. Dr. Dyseroff's laboratory has pioneered the development and use of what are called channel opsins, proteins that come from algae, which can now be introduced to the nervous systems of animals and humans in order to precisely control the activity of neurons in the brain and body with the use of light. This is a absolutely transformative technology because whereas certain drug treatments can often relieve certain symptoms of disorders, they often carry various side effects. And in some individuals, often many individuals, these drug treatments simply do not work. The channel opsins and their related technologies stand to transform the way that we treat psychiatric illness and various disorders of movement and perception. In fact, just recently, the channel opsins were applied in a human patient to allow an adult, fully blind human being to see light for the very first time. We also discuss Dr. Dyseroff's newly released book, which is entitled Projections, A Story of Human Emotions. This is an absolutely remarkable book that uses stories about his interactions with his patients to teach you how the brain works in the healthy and diseased state and also reveals the motivation for and discovery of these channel opsins and other technologies by Carl's laboratory that are being used now to treat various disorders of the nervous system and that in the future are certain to transform the fields of psychiatry, mental health, and health in general. I found our conversation to be an absolutely fascinating one about how the brain functions in the healthy state and why and how it breaks down in disorders of the mind. We also discuss the current status and future of psychedelic treatments for psychiatric illness, as well as for understanding how the brain works more generally. We also discuss issues of consciousness, and we even delve into how somebody like Carl, who's managing a full-time clinical practice and a 40-plus person laboratory and a family of five children and is happily married, how he organizes his internal landscape, his own thinking, in order to manage that immense workload and to progress forward for the sake of medicine and his pursuits in science. I found this to be an incredible conversation. I learned so much. I also learned through the course of reading Carl's book, Projections, that not only is he an accomplished psychiatrist and obviously an accomplished research scientist and a family man, but he's also a phenomenal writer. Projections is absolutely masterfully written. It's just beautiful and it's accessible to anybody, even if you don't have a science background. So I hope that you'll enjoy my conversation with Carl Dyseroth as much as I did. And thank you for tuning in. Before we begin, I want to point out that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. In my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Roka. Roka makes eyeglasses and sunglasses that, in my opinion, are the very highest quality out there. The company was founded by two all-American swimmers from Stanford, and everything about the eyeglasses and sunglasses was developed with performance in mind. One of the things I really love about Roka sunglasses is that unlike other sunglasses that make it hard to see when there's a lot of cloud cover or when the shadows change or environmental conditions change, with Roka sunglasses, they clearly understand the science of the visual system because when I put them on for the first time, I noticed that as I moved into shadows or the cloud cover changed or the day got brighter or dimmer, 
everything was still crystal clear. And that's also because the lenses are tremendously high optical clarity and the glasses are really lightweight. You don't even notice that they're on. The other thing is that the eyeglasses, I wear readers at night, they're incredibly lightweight. And for both the sunglasses and eyeglasses, the aesthetic is terrific. Unlike a lot of performance eyewear, which frankly can look kind of cyborg-like and kind of ridiculous, the aesthetic of the glasses is such that you could really wear them anywhere, indoors or outdoors. If you'd like to try Roka eyeglasses, you can go to Roka, that's R-O-K-A dot com, and enter the code Huberman to save 20% on your first order. That's Roka, R-O-K-A dot com, and enter the code Huberman at checkout. Today's podcast is also brought to us by Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and reach your health goals. I am a big believer in getting regular blood work done. And now with the advent of good genetic DNA tests, I'm also a believer in analyzing your DNA. The simple reason for this is that many of the factors that impact our immediate and long-term health can only be measured and evaluated with a quality blood test. And now the DNA tests further inform our immediate and long-term health. One of the problems with a lot of DNA tests and blood tests out there, however, is that you get the information back and you don't know what to do with that information. With Inside Tracker, you get the numbers back of different metabolic factors, hormones, et cetera, but it also provides simple directives as to how perhaps you might want to change your nutritional intake or your exercise regimen or other lifestyle factors to bring those numbers into alignment with where you'd like them to be. Inside Tracker also makes this really easy. They have a dashboard that makes organizing that all very simple, and they can even have someone come to your house to take the blood and DNA test. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can visit insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 25% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Just use the code Huberman at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to us by Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one vitamin mineral probiotic drink. I started taking Athletic Greens way back in 2012, and I've taken it ever since, so I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast. The reason I started taking Athletic Greens and that I continue to take Athletic Greens is that it covers all my vitamin and mineral bases, and it covers my probiotic needs. There's now a wealth of data showing that probiotics support a healthy gut microbiome and that a healthy gut microbiome supports the gut-brain axis for healthy mood. It also supports metabolism, immune function, endocrine, that means hormone function, and a host of other important biological functions. I drink it once or twice a day. I mix it with water and a little bit of lemon juice or some lime juice, and it's absolutely delicious. If you'd like to try Athletic Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman. And if you do that, you can claim a special offer where they will give you a year supply of vitamin D3. In addition, they'll give you five free travel packs. Vitamin D3, as we all know, is very important for a huge range of biological functions and health. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Huberman for your athletic greens, the five free travel packs, and the year supply of vitamin D3. And now, my conversation with Dr. Carl Dyseroff. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time coming for me uh, because uh, you may not know this, but one of the reasons I started this podcast was actually so I could have this conversation. <laughs> it's, it's but one. There are other sure. reasons. But one of the goals is to be able to hold conversations with colleagues of mine that are doing incredible work in the realm of science. And then here we also have this really special opportunity because you're also a clinician. You yes. see patients and yeah. have for a long time. Yeah. So for people that might not be so familiar with the fields of neuroscience, et cetera, what is the difference between neurology and psychiatry? Well, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm married to a neurologist and I am a psychiatrist and we make fun of each other all the time. So uh, this is uh, a lot of neuroscientists and a lot of brain clinicians actually think these two should be the same field at, at some point in the future. They were in the past. They started together. Psychiatry, though, uh, focuses on disorders where we can't see something that's physically wrong, where we don't have a measurable, where there's no blood test that makes the diagnosis, there's no brain scan that tells us this is schizophrenia, this is depression for an individual patient. And so psychiatry is is much more mysterious. And the only tools we have are words. Neurologists are uh, fantastic physicians. They see the stroke on brain scans. They see the seizure and the pre-seizure activity with an EEG, uh, and they can measure and treat based on those measurables. In psychiatry, we have a harder job, I think. We use words, 
We have rating scales for symptoms. We can measure depression and autism with rating scales, but those are words still. And ultimately that's what psychiatry is built around. It's, it's an odd situation because we've got the most complex, beautiful, mysterious, incredibly engineered uh, object in the universe. And yet all we have are words to, to find our way in. So do you find that if a patient is very verbal or hyperverbal, that you have an easier time diagnosing them as opposed to somebody who's um, more quiet and reserved? Or it's, I could imagine the opposite might be true as well. Well, it, because we only have words, you've put your finger on a key point. If they don't speak that much, in principle, it's harder. The lack of speech can be a symptom. We can see that in depression. We can see that in the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. We can see that in autism. Sometimes by itself, that is a symptom, uh, a reduced speech. But ultimately, you do need something. You need uh, some some words to help guide you. And that, in fact, and there's, there's there are challenges that I, I can tell you about where patients with depression who are so depressed they can't speak, that makes it a bit of a challenge to distinguish depression from some of the other reasons they might not be speaking. And this is a, a sort of the art and the science of psychiatry. Um, do you find that there are uh, patients that have, well, let's call them comorbidities or conditions where they would land in both psychiatry and neurology, meaning uh, there's damage to a particular area of the brain and therefore they're depressed and how do you tease that out as a psychiatrist? Yeah, this happens all the time. Uh, Parkinson's disease is a great example. Um, it's a, it's a, it can be debilitating in so many ways. Uh, people have trouble moving, they have trouble walking, have trouble swallowing, and they can have uh, truly severe depression. Um, and this is, you might say, oh, well, they've got a life-threatening uh, illness. But there are plenty of neurological disorders where depression is not a strong, a strongly comorbid uh, symptom, uh, like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, for example. And depression is not a, a strong, uh, a strongly comorbid in that disease. But in Parkinson's, it is extremely common. And uh, as you know, in, in Parkinson's disease, we have loss of the dopamine neurons in the in the in the midbrain, and this is a very uh, uh, you know, specific population of cells that's dying, and probably that leads to both the movement disorder and the depression. There are many examples of that where these two fields come together, and you really need to work as a team. I've had patients in my clinic that I, I treat the depression associated with their Parkinson's, and a neurologist treats the movement associated with the Parkinson's, and we work together. Do you think we will ever have a blood test for depression or schizophrenia or autism? And would that be a good or a bad thing? I think uh, ultimately there will be quantitative tests. Uh, already efforts are being made to look at certain rhythms in the brain using external EEGs uh, to look at brain waves effectively, look at the ratios of certain frequencies to other frequencies. And there's some progress being made on that front. Uh, it's not as good as it, it could be. It doesn't really give you the confidence for the individual patient that you would you would like. But ultimately, what's going on in the brain in psychiatric disease is physical, uh, and it's due to the circuits and the connections and the projections in the brain that are uh, not working as they would in a, a typical situation. And I, I do think we'll have those measurables at some point. Now, is that good or bad? Uh, you know, I, I think that will be good. One of the challenges we have with uh, psychiatry is it is an art as well as a science to elicit these uh, symptoms uh, in a precise way it does take some time and it would be great if we could just do a quick measurement um, could it be abused or or, or misused uh, certainly but that's I think true for all of medicine mm -hmm. I want to know and I'm sure there are several but what do you see as the biggest challenge facing psychiatry and the treatment of mental illness today I think we have uh, we're making progress on what the biggest challenge is, which I think there's still such a strong stigma for psychiatric disease that uh, patients often don't come to us um, and uh, they feel that they should be able to handle this on their own. And that, that can slow treatment, it can lead to you know worsening symptoms. We know, for example, patients who have uh, untreated anxiety issues, if you go for a year or more with a, a serious untreated anxiety issue that can convert to depression. You can add another 
a uh, problem on top of the anxiety. And so it would be, you know, why do people not come for treatment? They, they, they feel like this is something they should be able to master on their own, uh, which, which can be true, but uh, usually uh, uh, some help is, is, is a good thing. That raises a, a question related to something I heard you say many years ago at a lecture, which was that um, this was a scientific lecture, and you said, you know, we don't know how other people feel most of the time we don't even really know how we feel yeah. maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit and the the um dearth of of ways that we we have to talk about feelings i mean there's so many words i don't know how many but i'm guessing there are more than a dozen words to describe the state that i call sadness but as far as i understand we don't have any way of comparing that in a, in a real objective sense so how as a psychiatrist when your job is to use words to diagnose words of the patient to diagnose, do you maneuver around that? And, and what is this landscape that we call feelings or emotions? This is uh, really interesting. Uh, people, here we have a, there's a tension between the words that we've built up in the clinic that mean something to the, to the physicians. And then there's the colloquial use of words that may not be the same. And so that's the first level we have to sort out when someone says, you know, I'm I'm depressed. Uh, what exactly do they mean by that? Uh, and that may be different from, from what we're talking about in terms of depression. So part of psychiatry is to get beyond that word and to get into how they're actually feeling, get, get rid of the, the jargon and get to real world examples of, of how they're feeling. So, you know, how do you, what, how much do you look forward into the future? How much uh, hope do you have? How much planning are you doing for the future? So these here now you're getting into actual things you can talk about that are unambiguous. If someone says, "Yeah, I, I can't even, I can't even think about tomorrow. I, I'm not, <laughs> I don't see how I'm going to get to tomorrow." That that's a nice, precise thing that you know it's it's sad, it's tragic, but but it's also that means something, and we know what that means. That's the hopelessness symptom of depression. And, and that is what I try to do when I do a psychiatric interview. I try to get past the jargon and get to what's actually happening in the patient's life and, and in their mind. But as you say, ultimately, you know, and this shows up across, I, I, I address this issue every day in my life, whether it's in the lab where we're, we're looking at animals, whether fish or mice or rats and studying their behavior, or when I'm in you know, a conversation with just a, a friend or a colleague, or when I'm talking to a patient, I never really know what's going on inside the mind of the other person. I get, I get some feedback, I get words, I get behaviors, I get actions, but I never really know. And as you said at the very beginning of the question, you know, often we don't even have the words and the insight to even understand what's going on in our own mind. I think a lot of psychiatrists are pretty introspective. Uh, that's part of the reason they end up in that specialty. And so... Uh, maybe we spend a little more time than the average person thinking about what's going on within, but it doesn't mean we have answers. Mm -hmm. So in um, this uh, area of trying to figure out what's going on under the hood through words, it sounds like certain words uh, would relate to this, uh, this idea of anticipation and hope. Mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say that that somehow relates to the dopamine system in the sense that dopamine is involved in motivated behaviors I mean, is that in, if I say, for instance, and I, I won't ask you to run a session with me here for, uh, for free. Um, we'll do that off camera. Okay. Right. Um, if I were to say, you know, I, I just can't imagine the tomorrow. I just, it's, I, can't, I just can't do it. So that's, that's not action based. That's purely based on my, my internal narrative. Um, but I could imagine things like, you know, I, I have a terrible time sleeping I'm not hungry. I'm not eating. So statements about physical actions, I'm guessing, also have um, validity. Absolutely. And there are now ways to measure the accuracy of those statements. Like, for instance, if I gave you permission, you could know if I slept last night or whether or not I was just saying I had a poor night's sleep. Yes, um, that's right. So in moving forward through 2021 and into the next 10 and 100 years of psychiatry, do you think that the body reporting some of the actions of a human um, are going to become useful and, and me mesh with the words in a way that's going to make your job easier. 
I do think that's true. And these, the two things you've mentioned, eating and sleeping, those are additional uh, uh, criteria that we use to diagnose depression. These are the vegetative signs we call them of depression, poor sleep and poor eating. And if you have a baseline for somebody, that's the real challenge though. What's different in that person? Some people with depressed, they sleep more. Some people with, who are depressed, they sleep less. Some people who are depressed, they're more physically agitated and they move around more. Some people who are depressed, they, they move less even while they're awake. And so you need, here's the challenge, is you, you can't just look at how they are now. You have to get a, a baseline um, and then see how it's changed. And that can be a challenge that raises you know, ethical issues. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you collect that baseline information from someone healthy? I don't, I don't think that's something we have solved. Of course, you know, with phones and accelerometers and phones, uh, you could, in principle, collect a lot of baseline information from people. But that would have to be uh, treated very uh, carefully uh, for privacy reasons. And in terms of measuring one's own behavior, you know, I I've heard of work that's going on. Um, Sam Golden up at the University of Washington, um, who works on aggression in animal models, was telling me that there's some efforts that he's making, and perhaps you're involved in this work as well. I don't know of um, devices that would allow people to detect, for instance, when they're veering towards a depressive episode for themselves, that they may choose or not choose to report that to their clinician. Maybe they don't even have a clinician. Maybe this person that you referred to at the beginning, uh, this person who doesn't feel comfortable coming to talk to you, they um, maybe something is measuring changes in the inflection of their voice mm -hmm. or the, mm -hmm. the speed at which they get up from a chair. Do you think that those kind of metrics will eventually inform somebody, hey, you know, you're in trouble? This is getting to this question of, uh, the, back to the statement that I heard you make and rung in my mind now, I think for more than a decade, which is oftentimes we don't even know how we feel. Yeah, you know, that that I do like because that gives the patient the agency to, to detect what's going on. and. Even separate from modern technology, this has been part of the, the art of psychiatry is to help patients realize that sometimes other people observing them can give them the earliest warning signs of depression. We see this very often in, in, in family. They'll, they'll notice when the patient is changing before the patient does. And then there are things the patient may notice but not correctly ascribe to the onset of depression. And a classic example of that is what we call early morning awakening. And this is something that can happen very early as people start to slide into depression. They start to wake up earlier and earlier, you know, just inexplicably. They're awake. At, so this is like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. type yeah, waking? It, it could start, yeah, it could start at 5 a.m., could go to 4. And unable three. to fall back asleep. Unable to fall back asleep, exactly. Uh, so that's, and that, they may not know what to do with that. It could just be, <laughs> from their perspective, it's just something that's happening. But if you put enough of that information together, that that could be a useful warning sign for the patient and it could help them seek treatment. And I think that is a, something that could be really valuable. Interesting. So in this framework of, you know, needing words to self-report or machines to detect how we feel or, and maybe in form of a psychiatrist, uh, how a patient feels, I want to um, touch on some of the technologies that you've been involved in building, but as a way to march into that, are there any very good treatments for psychiatric disease? Meaning, are there currently any pills, potions, forms of communication that reliably work every time or yes. work in most patients? And could you give a couple examples of great successes of psychiatry if they exist? Yes. Yeah, we are fortunate. And this coming back to my, uh, you know, the, the joking uh, between my wife and myself in terms of neurology and psychiatry, we actually, in psychiatry, despite the depths of our, the mystery we struggle with, we, many of our treatments are actually, you know, we're, we're, we may be doing better than some other specialties in terms of actually causing, you know, the therapeutic benefit for patients. We do help patients, you know, the patients who suffer from, uh, by the way, both medications and talk therapy have been shown to be extremely effective in many cases. Uh, for example, people with panic disorder, Cognitive behavioral therapy, just working with words, helping people identify the early signs of when they're starting to move toward a panic attack, what are the cognitions that are happening, you can train people to derail that and, and you can very potently treat panic disorder that way. How long does something like that take for uh, on average? For a motivated, insightful patient, you can have a, a, a very, uh, you know, cookbooky series of sessions, you know, uh, six to 12 sessions or, or even less for someone who's very uh, insightful and motivated and it can have a very powerful effect that quickly. Um, and that's just with words. 
there are many psychiatric medications that are very effective for uh, the conditions that they're treating. Uh, antipsychotic medications, they have side effects, but uh, boy, do they work. They really can clear up, particularly the positive symptoms of, of schizophrenia, for example, the auditory hallucinations, the paranoia. People's lives can be turned around by these. 